So we can start, I guess. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so welcome to uh, this Fields Academy graduate course, uh, Spectral Geometry. Uh, as you know, Fields Institute this year has a new initiative. So they're offering quite a few, uh, seven, eight, I guess, uh, grad, grad courses. So this is a Spectral Geometry course. Um, so I'm very glad to teach this course. Uh, seems like exciting and exciting group of students we have from all over the world. So um, the lectures will be, this will be the venue for the lectures. I, I hope we can continue like this uh, so that I can still be able to use the blackboard. Um, so I guess uh, in, in kind of course outline, I, I talked about uh, most of the issues that might be uh, kind of preliminary issues and you might be interested to know. So I won't spend any time uh, talking about those, um, the, uh, the logistics, logistics of the course, so to speak. Um, uh, so it's very, very important to be interactive. So please feel free to interrupt me to make comments, uh, pose questions, uh, even challenging ones, uh, whatever you feel. If there's an argument that you cannot follow, it's very important you stop me and, uh, and, and make sure that you understand uh, as uh, we go along and uh, I'll do my best. So, um, so let me just uh, give uh, then, uh, if you don't have any questions or comments, uh, then maybe I just uh, start uh, giving a kind of quick introduction, actually, maybe even starting the course. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, okay, it looks like there are none right now. Uh, so this uh, thing on, course spectral geometry uh, really started uh, with a big result of Hermann Weyl in 1911. So this is called the Weyl's asymptotic law. So this was proved by John Herman Weil in 1911. So the result um, uh, can be formulated like this. So let's fix omega inside Rn, uh, a domain. So domain means that in particular it is uh, uh, compact, its interior, of course, is open uh, with uh, piecewise smooth boundary. Smooth boundary. Uh, now, this Issue of piecewise uh, piece, piece uh, smooth boundary uh, or um, how smooth the boundary is, it, it, it's a very, very delicate issue actually. So I don't want to get at it right now. So this term actually is not very well defined as, as, I, as I say, but let's assume that we have some feeling at least in two dimensions, uh, we have a feeling what piecewise smooth means. Uh, so let's keep that in mind. Uh, so we can have some domain like this. So, um, so then um, to this domain, uh, we are going to um, attach uh, some numbers. So the numbers are, are defined uh, by solving the so-called Helmholtz equation. Uh, 
So what is Helmholtz equation? So first of all, what is uh, Laplacian? The Laplacian is this operator minus sum V2 E x i squared i from one to n. Notice I put minus sign here. Okay. Usually Laplacian you see in 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 usual courses this doesn't have minus sign, but our Laplacian has minus sign. So pick uh, keep that in mind, please. That's that's an important point to have minus here. That helps a lot with formalism later on. And the question that we are asking, the, the, the problem that we are asking is the following eigenvalue problem. So we want to solve Laplacian of phi equal to lambda phi. And uh, we want to make sure phi restricted to boundary of omega is equal to zero. Okay, so this condition uh, it's called the uh, Dirichlet boundary condition. This is this uh, Dirichlet boundary condition. And of course, we want phi to be non zero for this to be a sensible eigenvalue problem because phi equal to zero is always a solution. We are not interested in that. Then um, what, what can be proved, it's, it's a result that was already known uh, around the time that uh, Weil uh, picked up uh, the issue. So what is known is the following. Uh, there is this, um, I, I put it like this as a fact. Uh, as I said, uh, I may prove this later on, but it's not so urgent for us. We, 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 we use a fact from functional analysis and analysis, which is the following. This I can uh, call it the spectral decomposition theorem. says that, uh, first of all, this problem has a solution only for certain discrete set of values of lambda. First of all, uh, solutions exist only for a set so this set of values, um, lambda one, bigger than zero, the first one, less than equal to lambda two, less than equal to lambda three. And these numbers are going to infinity. And uh, there might be repetitions, multiplicities. As you know, like eigenvalues of a matrix might have multiplicities. Here also, you may have multiplicities. So then, uh, then there exists the accompanying uh, functions phi i that satisfies this condition. Of course, delta of phi i equal to lambda i phi i, and phi i, of course, restricted to uh, boundary of uh, this is equal to zero. Okay, we have that. Um, so this set, so all of a sudden these numbers emerge, a discrete set of numbers, strictly positive, going to infinity like that. This is called the Dirichlet spectrum of this domain omega. So spectrum for now, uh, maybe, maybe we call it Dirichlet, but let's just be not very formal, just call it the spectrum of omega. Some, sometimes we call it even the spectrum of Laplacian, but it's subject to these conditions that the domain and boundary conditions really matter here. So this is the set lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, and so on, so forth. So this is the first set of numbers 
that we can, by using this theorem, extract. And second uh, thing is that these functions by i's, i from one to infinity, form an orthonormal basis for square integrable functions on L2 of n. So the set of by i's, Uh, of course, we have to normalize them because exactly like linear algebra, if you have a set of eigenvectors, uh, if you don't normalize them, uh, you don't get uh, unit uh, eigenvectors, but you can normalize them and then you get unit vectors here the same. Uh, normalized. Uh, so this is a form. An orthonormal basis for L2 of uh, omega. So this space L2 of omega is the space of all functions f from omega to c uh, that are square integrable. First of all, these are measurable functions, and they are square integrable in the sense that integral absolute value of f square d and x over omega is less than infinity. Okay, so um, this is the n-dimensional uh, uh, Lobeck uh, volume form on Rn. Integrating over omega system. So this space is quite huge. The smooth functions are there, but there are a lot of non-smooth non functions also, L2 functions that are there. Now, there are two things here. Uh, first of all, orthogonality. Uh, normality is not a problem because we just made it normalized, right? And then we have orthogonality. Orthogonality is also not very difficult. It just follows from formal self adjoinedness of this problem. So this uh, way we can make sure that orthonormality uh, is okay. But what is uh, very, very non-trivial and deep, deep fact of analysis is that uh, they form a basis. Uh, so, I mean, it could happen that they are still orthonormal, they're orthonormal, but it's still not big enough not a large enough set to form a basis. They do form a basis. And this is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite an important fact. Um, uh, so are there any questions by any chance at this stage? Uh, so I have a question. Yes, uh, please. Yes. So speaking of basis, uh, do we mean, always mean Hilbert's basis? That's right. That's right. That's a very good point. We mean Hilbert space spaces. Exactly. We don't mean, uh, yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, that's a very good point. We don't mean vector space spaces. As, uh, for, as, as vector spaces, just uh, al algebra vector spaces or linear algebra vector spaces, these spaces, are they, their dimension is uncountable even, right? So the, we, we don't expect to have a countable basis. But this is a Hilbert space basis in the sense that any function can be written as sum, as L2 sum in terms of these Fn. So any function can be written as sum Cn Fn, where sum of Cn squared is less than infinity. Right, that's uh, exactly as a Hilbert basis, yes. Very good, so this was an excellent question. Any other questions? Okay. So this is the thing that was known already uh, more or less by the time of Weil. Actually, the school that Weil uh, did his PhD, it was Göttingen and Hilbert and his students, including Weil, were developing these things, uh, these results. So he, they knew these this results very well. Now, um, so, what, uh, so what Weil proved now, having these numbers, in mind, uh, this was a symptomatic law is the following result. Uh, 
Um, so he basically found the rate of growth of these lambda ns, because lambda ns are numbers that are going to infinity, and it makes sense to ask with what rate they are going to infinity, how fast they are going to infinity, how uh, uh, you know, slow they are going to infinity. You know, are they like polynomially uh, growing? Are they exponentially growing? Is it something else? So what uh, Herman Weil proved uh, was that lambda k is asymptotic to 2 pi squared over omega n volume of omega to the power 2 over n times k to the power 2 over n as k goes to infinity. So this k is a running index, one, two, three, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. Uh, we don't know what they are, but they grow like uh, powers of k, but in this form, two to the n. Remember, n is dimension of omega. I mean, dimension of the domain omega, or this is space r n that we are in. And this volume, you should pay close attention to this volume. The volume is the Lobeck uh, volume of this domain, which is a finite number, right? So this is volume. This omega n is a universal constant, has nothing to do with omega. It's um, uh, volume uh, of unit ball. in the Euclidean space. So Bn inside Rn is the unit ball. You know, there is a formula in terms of factorials and gamma functions and things like that, pi, powers of pi, which I don't remember actually, but there's a formula for volumes of unit balls in Rn, for all n is known. So that's it. So and pi, of course, is pi. So that's it. So it gives uh, this asymptotic law. And of course, we know what asymptotic law means. It means that if you take this, divided by the right hand side, and take the limit, in the, in the ratio in the limit goes to one. That's all it says. It doesn't say something more than that or less than it. It's really the ratio of the two sides, as you take the limit, k going to infinity goes to one. This is called asymptotic law. So, um, why this result is so amazing? So, okay. So what can say for many things? The first thing is that if you know the spectrum of your domain, for example, the Dirichlet spect spectrum of your domain, then uh, you know it's volume, right? First of all, is that spectrum determines the volume. Because you cannot have two systems of numbers like that so that the ratio is going to be the same but with different volume with different constant coefficient in front like this, or different powers like that. So I will elaborate on that. I mean, this is not totally obvious, but I, I want to make it clear that this is not difficult either. Um, so, um, so let me make a definition first of all. Uh, two domains are called isospectral
inside Rn prime for some other power. I'll call it isospectral. If uh, then the spectrums are the same, uh, of course, counting multiplicities also. So not only those numbers are the same, but the number of times that each of them repeats are also the same. So if uh, I can write spectrum of omega is equal to a spectrum of omega prime, uh, I just say counting multiplicities. So now there is another definition. So this is part one. Um, part two is that uh, let's call two domains that are both inside, say, Rn. Again, inside Rn, are called isometric. Um, so they, if they are isometric in the sense of uh, just uh, metric geometry, in the sense that there should exist an isometry of Rn that takes one to the other. Uh, okay, so let me just, uh, if there exists A belonging to Rn, this is the orthogonal group acting on Rn, group of orthogonal matrices, uh, such that A of omega is equal to um, omega prime. So the, the, the division you have is that, okay, so this is in Rn and you have one domain, and then you rotate kind of coordinate axis in an orthogonal way, you get into another one, and this is omega and this is omega prime, you are coming from here to there through this orthogonal transformation. Now, you may complain about this definition and say that, hey, you just got a very restricted, you just gave me a very restricted definition in the sense that why this A has to be linear. I can imagine, I can conceive a map which is um, not, initially linear, but just preserves the distances. It's, uh, it's conceivable. We have a map from omega just to omega prime. It's, it's not even defined outside from taking omega to omega prime in such a way that distances are preserved. Uh, that, that's a valid point. Uh, in this case, though, I don't think you will get anything beyond these linear maps. But then we go over manifolds, we have to take this more flexible definition. But in this case, this, this is good enough. So, okay. So Do you want to consider translations? Uh, oh, yes, exactly. Very good point. So I should say EN, yes. So EN, very good, thank you. So EN is equal to ON, semi-direct product with so this is translations and rotations, right? The, so, so this is the set of all maps of the form sending x to ax plus b, where a belongs to on and b belongs to r. Is that better? Question uh, is is. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, very good. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for mentioning this. I was going to uh, escape. <laughs> I was going to, to make it. This, is, this would be a blunder, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we need the end. Euclidean motions, not just one. 
yeah anyhow so um we have the notion of uh isospectral and we have the idea of isometry and now uh Wiles law shows that if you have um, two domains that are isospectral then the dimension are the same and the volumes are the same so this is the corollary of Wiles law is that isospectral domains of the same dimension and volume. So, um, as I said, by uh, looking at the corresponding sequences here, uh, lambda k and lambda k primes are the same, so the limit on the left hand side is constant one. So, these two numbers, pick n and pick omega prime, and then n prime, and so n and omega, n prime and omega prime, put these things equal to each other in the limit, they are going to be the same if and only if. The constant of this are the same in front of k, and also powers are the same. Otherwise, there is no way the limit's going to be the same because they just can't match. It's like it's not polynomial; it's inverse powers, but it's like polynomial powers in some sense. So that's anyhow. So that's one thing. Now I want you to do a exercise, which is. This is exercise one, so this is important. Uh, show that if two domains are isometric, then uh, they are isospectral. Isometric domains are isospectral. I can give you, give you a hint. So the hint is you have to show that these Euclidean motions commute with the action of Laplace. So if you change coordinates according to Euclidean motion, apply Laplace is like the same as applying Laplace first and then applying uh, your uh, Euclidean motion. And the reason for this is that this structure of Laplacian is sums of squares with same coefficients. And also that, that, that immediately shows that it is <clears throat> orthogonal invariant. And also translation invariant is because differential operators DDX are even translation invariant. So that's, uh, so this is a good little exercise to do. Okay. So, but the real question that uh, was asked, uh, not at the time of Weil, maybe, maybe Weil and other people were also thinking about it. The question was, is the converse true? Is it true that if you have two isospectral domains, uh, they are uh, isometric? So the big question was this, So this is a question that was at least in print was uh, stated by Mark Katz in, uh, in a very famous paper. Uh, Katz was a great expositor of mathematics. He was a great mathematician, also was a great expositor in 1966. Actually that paper won a prize for expository writing, but there, there is new mathematics in the paper too, but 
for its clarity, but I, I highly recommend uh, Katz's paper. Uh, so the question is, um, does isospectral imply isometric? So the way that um, Katz and other people before him, actually, this goes back even to 19th century uh, in these lines, there is a mu musical kind of terminology that was introduced to capture the essence of this. The terminology was this. Um, can one hear? The shape of a drum. Of a drum. Uh, excuse me, Masoud. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know it's my device, but sometimes I'm losing your voice. I don't know if it's happening to other people too or not. Oh, sorry. Is it, uh, is it happening to other people as well? It's okay for me. It's happened a few no times. problem for me. Oh, it could be that, uh, but I'm not uh, frozen, right? Never. Uh, never no, frozen. it's not, but sometimes I... I, I do not hear you for like five seconds. Oh, that's, uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. So maybe no I'm problem. just, uh, I'm just maybe, maybe I should not get too far from the screen. I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. But I, okay try to be, I, I try to be here uh, and I tried maybe, I don't know if, uh, if I shout it would help, I don't know. But no, it's I good. I thought probably, probably my device had problem. Maybe it is, yeah, maybe, because okay. it, others okay. don't have a problem, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. So isometric uh, is, uh, so yeah, can one hear the shape of a drum? But um, this is a question maybe, uh, but then of course you have to ask, hey, wait a minute, uh, what is hearing? I mean, uh, we, are, we are talking about just a spectrum in the sense of solutions of this Helmholtz equation. Where is the music? Where is the hearing? I mean, I will explain why, why we are talking about hearings and uh, frequencies of voice and uh, drums and this sort of things. This sort of colorful terminology that captures or musical terminology that captures the situation, I will explain it soon. But this is, this is a big question. And of course, by shape of a drum means really up to isometry, because what is shape? Shape is everything up to isometry, right? That's, I mean, if you, if you can just rotate and translate in space, these uh, figures, uh, well, the shape doesn't change, right? So up to that, um, one expects uh, maybe this is true. This was uh, turned out to be too much. So, the first counterexample, though, which uh, I will do uh, soon. Uh, so this is, is due to Milner. So amazingly, Milner's paper actually, I don't know. I mean, OK, so what? Well, it's not amazing. Milner's paper actually appeared uh, before uh, 1966. I, I believe it's in 1964. Uh, but Milner's example was in 16 dimensional space. <laughs> so Milner constructed two actually smooth manifolds, uh, two 16 dimensional smooth manifolds. In fact, uh, more than that, flat tori, I should say. I will construct them, flat tori. That are isospectral, but are not isometric. Uh, that are isospectral, but not isometric. 
So he, if you want, in sixteen dimensional uh, space, he found uh, some counterexamples, which is beautiful, amazing, and there's a lot of good mathematics went into proving that. Um, so I will uh, give uh, this proof uh, soon. What Katz's question was really about domains in R2, just uh, domains in the plane. And to bring uh, this counterexample from 16 dimensional case to two dimensional counterexamples, it was a huge uh, effort. Uh, so it came into several, came in several steps. Uh, and the example that they found in two dimensions There is a very famous, uh, they got really uh, famous by proving this result uh, due to Gordon, Gordon uh, Webb and Wolpert. Um, they count example are two domains in R2 but those domains don't have a smooth boundary. The, the boundary is piecewise smooth. So still today, we don't know how to construct two domains in, in R2 with piecewise smooth boundaries, which are isospectral, but not isometric. So maybe it's true, nobody knows. So there, so there are a lot of, lot of open questions in this field. So uh, it's... Um, very active subject still. So that's one thing. Uh, but then again, going back to why this uh, result is very surprising, because another reason is that uh, computing a spectrum is very, very difficult. You know, when you have a finite matrix to compute its spectrum or set of eigenvalues, you, you have to solve an n by n equation, which is very, very expensive thing to do. Uh, numerically, right? I mean, even, I mean, there are no formulas, of course, beyond, di beyond dimension four, but even uh, numerically is very difficult. Now this uh, geometric problem is much more complicated. Only in just very, very symmetric situations, uh, having to do with Lie groups and a lot of symmetries, stuff like that, um, there, is, there are explicit formulas, but beyond that, Immediately, there are no formulas, and it's very, very uh, difficult to compute explicitly. No, uh, nevertheless, there is something like that, which is uh, which is quite uh, quite beautiful. Right? Any questions, by the way? Just really quick, you said there's no known example uh, in R two where they have smooth boundaries. Right. Right. Okay. There are no, yeah, we don't know if there is a counterexample with uh, smooth boundaries, isospectral domains with the smooth boundaries that are not isometric. We don't know that, yeah. Does somehow like sharp corners on the boundary help you to make things isospectral? Uh, sharp cor corners on the boundary? I think of peaceful smooth as like not having sharp corners, right? Right. Yeah, I think I think sharp corners actually, I mean, we have to, yeah, this is why I said that the issue of um, corners and how, what this, what piecewise smooth means is a bit delicate. Uh, even, I'm not sure even you can prove existence of eigenvalues if, if the corners are not uh, in a particular form. If, if they are not sharp corners, even maybe a spectral decomposition is not true or something. I'm not an expert on that. I'm sorry. But that's a, but that's that's a good point to bring in. Yeah. So um, um, and the, yeah. the counter examples that we know are mostly proved by subdividing the shape into triangles and then showing that you can sort of combine restrictions of eigenfunctions to different triangles. Yes. Um, but paste them together over other triangles. Yes. Uh, yes. So, sorry. You have two domains with triangulations. Uh -huh. You build eigenfunctions for one domain from eigenfunctions on the other domain restricted to these triangles that make it up. That's uh -huh. why the examples have sharp corners because they have nice triangulations. 
Oh yeah, by by I see. Yes, yes. By sharp corners, uh, you meant just like triangle corners. Is that what you meant? Yeah, that's what I meant. Oh yeah, yeah. That's right. No, no. That's absolutely uh, yes. That's that's needed. But by sharp corner, I meant uh, you know the cusps. For example, you have two lines um, meeting. It's not the smooth at that point. It's a cuspidal point. So they are tangent. The two branches are tangent at that point. So if they go with they approach each other, each other with angle zero. That could be a problem, I think. That could be a problem with the existence of eigenvalues. Even. So yeah, but if there is a kind of positive angle at that point, uh, existence is is true. And then, as Luke said, uh, indeed, in that case, I think uh, um, this should be a good example. Uh, I have one more question. Um, yes. yes. Uh, so so. Uh, so to, to what things does the spectral decomposition theorem hold? Like uh, you, you just said that maybe if it's uh, piecewise, like uh, the, the corners have to be in a certain way in order for the yes. spectral decomposition theorem to hold. But I yeah. think you stated it saying that it works for all things with piecewise smooth domain. Uh, well, I mean, the thing is, how do we define piecewise smooth uh, beyond dimension uh, two? Okay. It's, it's a bit problematic, right? Mm, okay. Because look at, for example, a three-dimensional, like a cube, for example. If you look at cube, you see, I mean, the corners are of two types. I mean, the, the, the boundaries of kind of points in the boundary are two types. Either uh, they come at the edge, but then there are these vertices. Then the, you see the nature of the manifold around that vertex is different compared to, so these are called uh, maybe a stratified spaces or something like that. So uh, this, uh, so piecewise smooth is difficult to define. So that's why most of the people uh, just make life easy for themselves. They consider a smooth boundary. So this is a manifold with boundary, smooth manifold with boundary, theorems work. But there are, it's known actually, the, the condition is exactly known and it needs uh, some heat equation techniques, some probability techniques to give the kind of best conditions for the boundary to be true. So even the smoothness is not totally needed, but there is some condition. So we can discuss that maybe uh, when uh, we go a little bit ahead in the course. Yeah, definitely. Very good. Are there any any other questions or comments? Yeah, one more question. So up till now we saw that uh, this spectral decomposition gives us some geometric properties of the domain. Can we recover some topological properties as well? Uh, some some other geometric some sorry which properties? Some geometric properties of the domain omega, right? Yes. Can the topolo can topological properties of omega yes. also be yes. recovered? Exactly, topological things also. Uh, indeed, uh, we will we'll get to that. Uh, in, in Katz's paper, we can show, for example, the number of holes, which is essentially Euler characteristic. I will prove it as well, even more general case. Euler characteristic can be captured from the spectrum, yes. Uh, Euler characteristic can be captured from spectrum. And higher cohomology groups also, but for that we have to go to uh, spectrum of Laplacian on forms, which I will discuss also. So yeah, a lot of topology also can be captured from the spectrum, but we have to introduce some techniques. Uh, what about um, um, not just cohomology groups, but the ring cohomology ring structure? Can you detect that? <laughs> uh, the ring structure, I'm not sure. I really don't know. I, 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 I don't know really. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a good that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean um, right. So that 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 could be. The, yeah, I, I really don't know the answer to that. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. Thanks. Sure, sure. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so now let us move on. And uh, so usually this result is formulated. Okay, so now uh, let me, okay, so this is uh, what's law. So let me give a little bit of history of this. 
how this came about, because it's a very interesting uh, history behind this. So this was actually conjectured by uh, Lawrence. Uh, you know, uh, Lorentz force in electrodynamics, a famous uh, Dutch physicist, H.A. Lorentz. So uh, this was uh, in 1910. So actually Hilbert invited him to Gottingen to give a series of lectures. So Lorentz uh, gave series of lectures. In one of the lectures, he actually mentioned that for general domains, uh, one should be able to get volume from the frequencies of vibrations of the membrane. Uh, and he explicitly said, said that even for uh, general topology kind of domains, this should be true. I mean, he, he formulated in his own language. I, th I think he said multiply connected spaces, this should be true. And then he mentions that one of his students has done this for um, for uh, boxes and for spheres. So this was, a, this was this is a thesis, PhD thesis actually. So that student, I forgot her name. Uh, she was uh, she 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 was a very good physicist eventually. So she was a student of uh, of Lawrence and uh, did it in her thesis. I was trying actually to get her thesis recently, but anyway, so that's another. Thing. So this was conjectured by Lawrence. Uh, but also by uh, other physicists, uh, Sommerfeld, and uh, Lord Rayleigh. Um, so, so Rayleigh was in theory of sound. As I will uh, discuss very soon. Uh, he was motivated by ideas from theory of sound and wave equation, and he came across the result. Sommerfeld was uh, more or less like Lorentz. He came from quantum mechanics, uh, and needs of quantum mechanics kind of forced this, uh, that they thought that this result better be true if they believe what they believed in quantum mechanics was true. So this is kind of very interesting story behind it. So um, anyhow, so, Hilbert and um, Hermann Weil, of course, were locals, were in the, were in the audience. And Hilbert, uh, it's said uh, that uh, it's kind of, there's a, there's a story about Hilbert that he said, I won't see a proof of this in my lifetime, which would be up to 1945 or something. But then uh, Hermann Weil, uh, his uh, bright student proved it in four months. So don't believe your teachers. <laughs> That's that's the lesson. So when say some someone says that something is not is very difficult, not possible, don't believe that. Just go and do it. Uh, most probably you can do it. Uh, so while well, did it in four months and published a uh, paper in 1911, early 1911. Okay, so that was the story behind this result. There are other interesting stories uh, related to the result. Now, there is another way of formulating the result, which is also used, and that's in terms of eigenvalue counting function. So let us introduce this number, n of lambda. We, again, we are, we are uh, talking about this spectrum and eigenvalue, right? Let's discuss n of lambda to be number of lambda i's less than or equal to lambda. Okay, so lambda belongs to, say, r, for example, right? I mean, this function only matters to us for a uh, range of lambda large enough, right? So this is called eigenvalue counting function. And uh, I want you to show that actually 
This result is equivalent to the following, the following thing. So this would be kind of exercise two. Um, Wise law is equivalent to uh, so there, there is an asymptotic formula for number of eigenvalues less than or equal to lambda, which is the following n of lambda is asymptotic to so this one actually takes an easier form cn volume of uh, omega lambda to the power n over two. As uh, n go, as lambda goes to infinity. Yeah, okay. So, well, Cn is just a constant, which is omega n divided by two pi to the power d uh, n, sorry. And of course, omega n is volume of the unit ball. So, okay, so number of eigenvalues, instead of giving the rate of increase of any eigenvalue, you're just giving total number, which are located in the interval, say, up to lambda is growing like that and i wanted to show that this result can be derived easily from this and vice versa they are equivalent so it's good to see that yeah. so for example um in dimension one then uh, number of eigenvalues grows like some constant uh, volume of omega uh, times uh, lambda to the power of half so this is for n equal to one, for n equal to two, n of lambda grows like C2, uh, volume of omega lambda, n equal to two, and n of lambda grows like another constant, volume of omega lambda to the power of three over two. So it's uh, it's like a polynomial growth, where the degree of polynomial is uh, like half of the dimension of the space. That's it. So in terms of n of lambda, it's, uh, it's growing. So this is all is not difficult to prove. It's uh, totally elementary. Now I want you to compare this. You remember any other results in mathematics that reminds you of something like this? Or that, does this result remind you of another result in mathematics? A big result, I would say. Prime number theorem. Prime number theorem, exactly. Yes. So you should really compare this result, and that's a very important comparison, actually, with prime number theorem. So let me write down the statement of PNT. It says that pi of x is asymptotic to x over log x. And this is actually asymptotic to uh, lead x. Uh, so this log is uh, what is really natural log. I mean, it's not a base 10 log. It's really natural log uh, as x goes to infinity. So let us not focus on that, just this one. So pi of x is equal to number of primes less than equal to x. So as you know, this was uh, conjectured by Legendre, by Gauss, uh, even Riemann, of course, was the basis of Riemann's famous paper on zeta functions and all that. But uh, it was proved in 1899 by Hadamard, Hadamard, and uh, de la Vallée Poussin. 
Uh, there, there are independent rules, but very similar to uh, well, uh, I may most probably misspell the, the French last name. Oh, actually, he was Belgian, uh, but it's French Belgian uh, last name. I'm sorry, Lula Valle Toussaint, most probably. They proved it uh, at the end of the century, more or less. It was it was called uh, one of those big theorems called theorem of the century. Uh, they proved uh, users complex analysis and all that, where, and it's conceptually I would say is more complicated than uh, Weiss proof. Uh, although Weiss proof came later, but this proof is uh, kind of I can say maybe more complicated, uh, but uh, okay. So, but it's in the same spirit. Why such a result is important? The reason is that actually Riemann hypothesis tells us what is the correction term to this, more or less. So this is an asymptotic estimate, but uh, Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to this. It's actually equivalent to saying that pi of x is equal to li x plus uh, O of root x log x. So I didn't tell you what Vx is. Vx is um, logarithmic integral of x, which is, this is equal to integral two to infinity, I believe, dt over log t. Oh, X, sorry. <laughs> this is um, amazingly, uh, although I mean, so it's not difficult to show that this function is asymptotic to this function. By the way, asymptotic of functions, you know what, what it means, right? Uh, so just let me tell you Fx asymptotic to Gx, you know that. By definition, if I'm only fx over gx goes to one. For example, as x goes to infinity. And this is the big O notation. It just means that uh, we say f equal to g. Um, uh, so I would say f equal to um, O g if uh, basically f is less than or equal to mg. I'm talking about positive functions here, for example. So this is capital O, and f is little og if the quotient actually goes to zero. So this is little o notation, this is capital O notation, and this is, of course, asymptotic notation, equivalence notation. So, so the result like this, um, prime number term, you can say it gives you the first term of the asymptotic uh, distribution of uh, primes. It gives you information about the number of primes, but only its first term. <clears throat> the best that you can do, more or less, seems to be this one. You see, the difference still goes to infinity. And it's not, um, but this <laughs> is um, kind of equivalent to Riemann hypothesis. That's why people say, if you prove Riemann hypothesis, uh, you have a very good information on the distribution of primes. So this is one of those results that tells you. Now, you might uh, guess then that, okay, so because we had this result of Y, that gave you uh, the kind of um, asymptotic expansion, but then may might be that this is just the first term of the expansion, right? Might be that uh, there are other terms in the expansion that are hidden and more geometric information is hidden there. And that's actually true. And in fact, Herman Weil himself uh, had some conjectures about those. So let me elaborate on that and then I will get to examples. Any questions, by the way? Is, oh. is there supposed to be any um, 
more more than passing resemblance between these two theorems do they share anything fundamental in common oh yes yeah no no that's 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 an excellent question they do share uh, things fundamental uh, uh, fundamentally in common indeed uh, the reason is that people are trying to prove Riemann hypothesis by first formulating a geometric version of the Riemann hypothesis along these lines. But then it is known that it's not enough to do it just for geometric spaces because that space, geometric spaces like manifolds, their spectrum cannot capture prime numbers. You must have some very, very strange kind of manifolds. So those manifolds, we put it in, in quotation marks. So some objects, so some call it Riemann flow uh, or um, polya Hilbert flow. Some call it non-commutative spaces. Some strange, mysterious, fictitious object is out there that if you do a spectral geometry in good enough way on it, then you will be able to prove uh, Riemann hypothesis. So that's one of the dreams. Indeed, a spectral geometry is very much kind of in, in the background of this thing. And we will see actually some of those uh, connections. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so now, um, uh, so higher, so corrections to Y's law, it's like this. So Weil actually conjectured that himself. Um, so this was uh, 1912. Um, so this was only conjectured. Uh, Weil conjectured that n of lambda that he introduced is actually, yeah is equal to Cn, well, we have this constant Cn, right? Volume of omega lambda to the power n over two plus Cn minus one, a volume of boundary of omega times lambda to the power n minus one over two uh, plus little o of lambda n minus one over two. Now, this was, uh, this is conjectured, or I, I would say was conjectured for, I guess, for piecewise smooth maybe, but let's assume that uh, this is uh, smooth uh, boundary maybe. So volume of, of course, boundary, you know, it, it's like a, it's like an n-dimensional smooth manifold with boundary, the, the domain omega itself is like that, then its boundary is n minus one dimensional smooth manifold without boundary, right? the boundary doesn't have a boundary again. So we take its n minus one dimensional volume, and that's the term for some constant c n minus one. Constant means that V just depends on the dimension. It not, doesn't depend on the constant uh, C n minus one. Okay, so in other words, while I was conjecturing that one can hear in, for example, in the two dimensional case, the length or the perimeter of the domain as well. So the perimeter length of the domain can also be read from its uh, spectrum. Because again, if you have two isospectral domains, the function of lambda is the same. And to have the right-hand side all satisfy this condition, there's only one way to be equal. There's only one way for that to match because the powers have to match. 
and the coefficients also have to match. The powers do match, but coefficients means that this one is volume. And for this, of course, is volume of omega volume of you. So this is. Uh, so this was conjectured already by Boyle, and this was actually, it took about 70 years to give a partial proof of this. Uh, so in around 1980, there was two proofs. Uh, I think uh, one was actually by uh, Victor Eadley in Toronto. I think back then he was in Russia. Victor, Victor Eadley was in Russia when he proved this. And uh, Richard Menlo's. I think uh, in MIT, they uh, proved this result under some conditions. So the conditions was uh, has to do with billiards, a structure of billiards that you play inside. You know, you play a game of billiards, and you want to say something. You want to postulate some properties of periodic uh, orbits of the billiard. If that's satisfied then they could prove the result. So, but in general, I don't think we know the answer even to that, whether it is true in most general case or not. Right. Uh, under some conditions, so let me put it like this, under some conditions. But, um, so this is already, it already took 70 years almost to get from Y to this, and they use a lot of modern techniques. Uh, but then now you can ask, okay, what about the other terms? <laughs> so nobody has any idea. I mean, this is completely open and very, very complex. Immediately you get into very, very complicated uh, deep waters, so to speak. So it's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting problem. Of the same nature as kind of, uh, correcting terms to prime number and distributions and stuff like that. Um, a question, is, is that small O or big O? Well, oh, this is a small O, I think. I think this is a small O. Because big O is already here. Oh. This power is here anyhow, so it should be small O, I believe. And does this imply that there is some kind of relationship between the eigenfunctions on a manifold with boundary and eigenfunctions on its boundary? Uh, I, I doubt it. I don't think so. I, I, I really um, don't think so because uh, you see, this this you're, you're starting from uh, from n of lambda, and uh, if you cut here, you just focus on this part. I really don't know. I I, I doubt it. That's a very good. That's an excellent question. Now. Um, Here, here is really, you want to think about this question uh, like this in general. So it's like what you're asking. So we have this manifold, right? And we attached a sequence of numbers. Uh, now we know how they grow, how fast they grow. But now someone might ask this question. Imagine you have a sequence of numbers going to infinity and they grow like the spectrum of an n-dimensional manifold. Does there exist a manifold whose spectrum is that set? This is not known. So if you think of a spectrum as a way of labeling kind of manifolds, a very, very fine labeling, in fact, it's kind of isometric thing uh, take into account. But if you, the question is, can you go back? Can you say that the, the map that goes into a spectrum, is it surjective, for example, into all sequences with that property? We don't know. Or uh, if you, I think the only thing that's known is that if one sequence is already a spectrum of manifold, you change the first finite number of them, then there exists an, another manifold whose spectrum is that. There are results like that, but beyond that, I don't think much is known. 
So these are again, very, very uh, kind of interesting issues immediately leads you into open problems, uh, which are, could be some of them could be difficult, but you should not believe your teachers anyhow, as I said, so. <laughs> right. Okay, right. So um, any other comments or questions? Okay, very good. So now we can, uh, so now it's time to look at some examples to get some kind of hands-on feeling for things because, uh, you know, so far we have been talking about these general results and uh, it's it now let's start some examples uh, which would be very, very useful. So the simplest example, of course, is in one dimension, right? So this is the simplest example. So this is 1D. Of course, if you are in 1D, you want to look at the interval zero, uh, maybe I'll just use A. Inside R. So this is a vibrating string, so to speak, but let's forget that right now. So Laplacian is minus d2 dx2. And the equation we have to solve is minus phi double prime equal to lambda phi, right? And phi of zero equal to phi of a equal to zero. So we are looking for some solution that is vanishing at the point, at that point is not zero and satisfies this equation. Well, these sort of equations we have solved is this undergrad stuff. And you know that uh, phi k of x equal to sine of uh, k by x over a. Uh, lambda k is equal to k pi over a squared, k equal to one, two, so on. Um, in this case, all eigenvalues are simple. That's one thing you notice immediately, uh, directly you calculate the simple eigenvalues. So the spectrum is simple, there are no multiplicities. And of course, uh, immediately you check that this verifies law, uh, y is law, and verifies uh, y is law in this case. Uh, because uh, you can uh, find n of lambda you can count these things, uh, estimate number less than okay, this is going to be a over pi root lambda. Growing actually squarely without any correction terms is because this is very simple geometry, but growing squarely is in accordance with Boyle's law. And uh, in this form also is equivalent to that. So a over pi root lambda. Now, the fact that, so what about the spectral decomposition? The spectral decomposition in this case follows from the kind of main statement of Fourier analysis, so Fourier series, you see? Uh, uh, so first of all, let's see, are these guys uh, uh, normalized or not? So what is norm? of phi k is equal to what? If you want to compute norm squared of phi k, you are going to compute integral from zero to a uh, sine squared of k pi x or a dx. Is this equal to one? Um, I don't know. 
but you can normalize it if not, if not. You can compute. I don't think it's equal to one, but you can normalize it. Maybe we have to multiply by one over root A or something, but it doesn't matter. So this you can compute easily. Uh, but then uh, spectral decomposition, Uh, so we are saying that basically up to some normalizations by k's, k from one to infinity, um, form an orthonormal basis. Uh, well, normal means orthogonal basis, Orto orto orthogonal basis uh, for uh, L2 of. Zero a. Now, this statement, as I said in this case, uh, follows from basic statements and Fourier series. Uh, this follows from Fourier series theory. So I would say, let's make it an exercise. So this is exercise three. Drive, drive is dr uh, I think it's with E, sorry. <laughs> uh, drive um, spectral decomposition from the fact that This sequence of functions, uh, in this case, I, I know I have to put one over root a e to the two pi i k x over a over a. Now k going from minus infinity to plus infinity uh, is an orthonormal basis. For L2 of 0, uh, you see, these are uh, exponentials. Uh, these are, um, uh, you see, I mean, Fourier basis for L2 of 0, a. these are periodic functions of period uh, A. So the values match at 0 and at A because it's just at A, x is A is 2 pi i k. K is an integer, so it's one. At zero is also one. So it's a periodic nice function on the circle. And it's also eigenfunction for Laplacian with eigenvalue essentially k squared or something. So I want you to drive this, this result from this uh, Fourier series uh, result. This kind of basic theorem in Fourier series. Uh, things, uh, basic, uh, I would say, function analysis or group representation theory. So you can, you can, you can drive it from that statement. So that's very good. Any questions or comments? Okay, so these uh, lectures are going to be roughly an hour and a half. So I think we still have 10 minutes. Is that okay if I continue for 10 more minutes? Okay, so this is, this is really our first example. Everything uh, can, be, uh, can be done by hand, basically you can see. And by the way, these functions, the functions here, uh, I mean, uh, eigenfunctions, uh, this is the first one, is that one, and then we have uh, higher uh, kind of uh, overtones, so to say. The next one is 0a, so this is this one, and then the next one, so this is k equal to 2, k equal to 1, and then next one is going to be so. Yeah, hopefully this is okay, yeah, almost. It's completely symmetric. Okay, so k equal to three. 
So immediately you get standing waves uh, for a vibrating string. So this is not accidental. I will, I will mention uh, that connection first. So this is, uh, right. So one of the things that I did not emphasize enough is uh, the role of eigenfunctions. You see, this sort of uh, spectral geometry has kind of, kind of two feelings to it. Uh, we can focus on properties of a spectrum. Uh, also, we can focus on properties of eigenfunctions. Uh, for example, where are the zeros of eigenfunctions? Do eigenfunctions kind of uniformly distribute in the domain or kind of lump somewhere and form some cluster somewhere? So there are a lot of interesting conjectures about nature of eigenfunctions uh, also. So we will discuss those. I did not discuss it yet, but we will do it. So uh, the next example along these lines, of course, is a box, spectrum of a box. That's important, simple, but important. So by box, they mean this omega equal to zero A1. I mean, it's a kind of rectangular box, zero A1, zero A2, zero AM. A rectangular box in RM. So let's take N equal to two, just make life simple for us. So let's take this one to be A and this one to be B. So we have a box like this. And uh, of course, Laplacian is negative dx squared, negative dy squared. And we want to solve uh, Laplacian of phi equal to lambda phi. And phi restricted to boundary equal to zero. Now, this uh, can also uh, easily be solved by elementary methods. And the solutions are uh, now, in this case, I label by two parameters. Uh, so I call it phi and nx equal to sine of k pi, um, k pi. Uh, so what is k? No, no. M pi x over a sine of. Uh, so n is unfortunate. So yeah, here that's why maybe k and n. Sorry. So I put k here, and I put n here. M uh, k, uh, m pi y over b. Now, the range of k and m are like this. k goes from 1 to infinity, and m goes from uh, 1 to infinity. So you see, and these are simple eigenfunctions. Oh, no, no, no. These are not simple. That was a slip of tongue, sorry. Uh, so eigenvalues, by the way, uh, are, uh, well, you have to apply Laplacian and see what you get. If you do it, you get uh, pi squared over a squared times m squared, times k squared, plus um, pi squared over p squared, uh, times m squared. So you can uh, factorize pi squared. This is pi squared times k squared over a squared plus m squared over b squared. So let's uh, make life a bit easier for us. Let's assume a is equal to b. Then in this case, uh, lambda km is equal to um, uh, 
1 pi squared over a squared times k squared plus m squared. Uh, k and m again going from 1 up to 3. And of course, you see that now um, there could be multiplicities, right? It's possible. Multiplicities can occur. So basically, multiplicities has to do with the fact that in how many different ways you can write an integer as sums of two squares. So this, so this, this immediately becomes a number theoretic problem. In how many different ways you can write a positive integer as sums of two squares? We know that for that to be true, I think that number has to be 4k plus 1. I guess, for example, 5 is equal to 4 plus 1. Uh, but uh, 3 uh, cannot be written as sums of two squares. So half of kind of integers can be written as sums of two squares. Uh, that's a theorem of Fermat and Euler, I guess. Um, so immediately, this is spectral geometry problem uh, gets you into number theory questions. And that's the way, actually, Jacobi, we're going to see it soon. Jacobi used uh, this connection to drive uh, number theoretic results by studying uh, what we now call theta functions. But theta functions are exactly um, traces of heat equations or Laplacians for this sort of domains. So there is a, a very nice number theoretic connection, again, uh, for the question of in how many, so the question is this, in how many different ways you can write uh, an integer as sums of k squares, for example, p squares, something like that. So this is, and there, there are some formulas that Jacobi derived, general result, using, using theta functions. So we'll discuss that. Because that also comes into Milnor's uh, proof, because the proof uses modular forms. So we'll, we'll get to that soon. Now, uh, so, so we, we, we calculated the spectrum, and we calculated the uh, functions. Now I ask a question, uh, maybe two minutes, uh, if you allow me. Uh, why zero is not in the spectrum in this problem? Because we, I always was careful to say that we have to start from positive. So the question is why zero does not belong to a spectrum of Dirichlet. Can you tell me why? This is the uniqueness of uh, Dirichlet problem for the... Uh, yes, uh, yes, exactly. This is the unique, exactly. This is the uniqueness of the Dirichlet problem. And uh, do you know how to prove this quickly, or maybe just I'm looking for a certain word? Green's identity. Harmonic functions. Sorry? Harmonic functions. Harmonic functions, yes, exactly. Yeah, harmonic functions. Also, Green's identity is relevant here. But harmonic functions, look, I mean, for lambda equal to zero, we are asking for the Laplacian of phi equal to zero. Right, because lambda equal to zero. And phi on the boundary of omega is equal to zero. So this tells us inside phi is harmonic. And then maximum principle applies, right? It, like in complex variables, you know, maximum principle uh, to, so by maximum principle, Uh, you can immediately show that uh, this guy has to be zero. 
which is, as it was said, is the uniqueness of the solution to the Dirichlet problem. In fact, for the Dirichlet problem, what is Dirichlet problem? Dirichlet problem gives you the boundary of the function, so it gives you the value of a function on the boundary and asks to find a solution inside which is harmonic to satisfy this equation. So that's, you should not confuse Dirichlet problem with Helmholtz problem. The initial problem is very natural problem, but Helmholtz is not very natural. It becomes natural only after we introduce wave equation or heat equation or this sort of thing. So Helmholtz is kind of auxiliary equation for itself. It's not a, doesn't, it doesn't come in a very natural way to anyone's mind. I mean, uh, you have to have a reason to study that question that we started with, right? But the initial problem is very natural. You're looking, uh, well, in some sense natural, you're looking for a function that satisfies this equation in, in the interior. And on the boundary, phi restricted to the boundary is equal to some. And for that, we know that uh, uh, there is a uniqueness theorem, which exactly uses this maximum principle for harmonic functions again, because you subtract the two things. So for this sort of boundary conditions, the boundary conditions that are Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, zero is never in the spectrum. So we always start from something bigger than zero. And the amount of gap between zero and the first eigenvalue, I mean, the magnitude of first eigenvalue is actually an important issue. And there are estimates for that, like Chigger estimates. I, I try to prove one of those later on. So this is another issue that's important. But if you change your um, uh, boundary condition, which I did not discuss, uh, to something like Neumann boundary condition, then zero becomes uh, a point in the spectrum. We'll discuss that uh, uh, soon, next lecture. So I'm hoping for the next lecture, we can put aside this sort of elementary um, uh, examples, which are uh, still important to bear in mind. And we start uh, proving this uh, Milner's uh, counterexample. Uh, so we start by proving something negative, and then I'll prove Weil's theorem for general Riemannian manifolds uh, after uh, deriving some, some techniques. So we are still building terminology and some basic techniques. Are there any questions, by the way? Yeah, so this lambda looks very much like the quantization of energy in quantum mechanics, is there something? Absolutely, like yes, 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 exactly. These lambdas are quite related. In fact, these are more or less the same thing as energy levels in quantum mechanics. So if you have a free particle that is uh, moving according to laws of quantum mechanics, satisfies Schrodinger equation, then the time-independent Schrodinger equation is exactly like this. Uh, Laplacian of phi equal to lambda phi. I'll discuss this actually. So because the connection with quantum mechanics is very relevant. So there are three physics connections that Laplacian comes into the game. One is wave equation. The other one is heat equation. And the third one is Schrodinger equation. I will mention all those but we will mostly use heat equation techniques. Uh, wave equations are very powerful, much more complicated to use. And Schrodinger equations also are powerful. And they, each of these, these connections give you a different perspective on the nature of the spectrum actually. So these are very, very important. This was a very good point, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I had a question about the what well, you said about the uh, theta functions. Uh, yes. So, uh, if you said that Jacobi tried to use this multiplicity thing to understand number theoretic problems, are you saying he uh, take a number theory problem, translate it into a certain space of different domains, and then you can vary the domains and see when the there is like multiplicity happening? No, um, so what, what Jacobi did, actually, if you uh, try to read Jacobi's papers, you don't see any geometry there. Although, I mean, there's a lot of geometry in the background, but you see pages of pages of pages of amazing calculations and formulas. So for that, he introduced theta functions. Actually, he introduced 
four types of theta functions. And he wrote uh, some uh, identities, some functional equations for theta function. I will write one of them. And uh, using that, he basically uh, could uh, show that, and then writing different equations for different theta functions. And also beginning of theory of modular forms, he could prove that sometimes these coefficients are non-zero, hence it's possible to write certain numbers as sums of certain squares, certain sums of squares. So he, he gave very, very precise information, much more powerful than his predecessors. But he did not use uh, geometry uh, in that sense. So it's one of those instances that, in this case, formal analytic uh, algebraic sort of computations with theta functions of different kinds was, uh, was already pushing ahead without geometric background. But we'll see that theta functions arise naturally, very, very naturally as a heat trace of, uh, of uh, flat uh, tori. And this is very important connection. This is very, very important connection. Okay, thanks. Because, uh, yeah, he proved, yeah, the, so he proved like trace formulas and stuff like that, which we'll prove and like Poisson summation formula will prove. And these are really kind of the tool bag of, uh, should be, and tools of any person working on analytic number theory, spectral geometry, working on Riemann hypothesis, things like that. So these are very, very important uh, tools uh, to have. Okay, so any other comments or questions? So the, um, the counter example, example that Milner gave in 16 dimensions with flat tori, you said yes. that was, so that's a um, smooth, a smooth boundary. And in two dimensions, it was like a piecewise smooth boundary. Do we know of counter examples and like kind of, you know, more down to earth manifolds with smooth boundaries or not really? Yeah, I, right. So actually in the case of, I have to say, in the case of Milner, actually the manifold is even doesn't have a boundary. I mean, the manifold is a smooth without boundary. Yeah, yeah, right. It's really like a Torah, like, so you just take Rn divided by lattice. I, I will discuss this. Divided by lattice, and then you have a, you have a nice flat tori, quotient of flat Rn, and its a spectrum can be easily calculated. Actually, we have all elements here, and um, so to show that um, the manifolds are isospectral was not difficult, but to show that um, they are not isometric, uh, it was. Um, Oh, no, maybe to show that they are not isometric was not difficult, but to show that they are isospectral, it was very difficult. So you had to use the theory of modular forms. Uh, and for that, actually, it was already done by, by a German number theorist, Ernst Witt, in 1940, I think. He wrote a paper and he proved the statement. And Milner's genius was to notice this, <laughs> this result. And he saw that, okay, aha. Uh -huh. I need this and that's it, that will do, do me the best job. So he just, uh, he just picked it up from there. Milner's paper is very short. You will be amazed how short the paper is. It's just half a page. <laughs> because he had all the elements already in place. So, but I have to give the background and prove the results that he used. He didn't have to give the proof, but uh, because I give the proof of by N suite basically, so that's. Okay, that was a good question. Thank you. So any other comments or questions? Or... Uh, I will send you all emails uh, tonight actually, so that you can please join uh, the, uh, the our site because that's much easier for me to communicate because I, can, you know, I cannot use Fields Institute uh, po uh, portal or platform, uh, unfortunately, but OWL is something it's very easy. I'll send you emails from that, and you you can you can you can enter uh, our portal or platform uh, without any problem. I'll send you emails. Invite you all to to that. Okay. And uh, so, if there are no other questions, thank you so much. I think uh, this was good. So I'll see you on Wednesday then. And if you have questions, please let me know. Send emails. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I just... Uh...